I can't help making a shameless plug for the first reading of this spring before I introduce Margaret. Um, Bob Haas, founder of Lunch Poems, will be reading in February. There he is in the audience, being a good citizen. Be happy. I'm sure some of you will be back for that. Come early to get a seat. All right, to Margaret Ross's work. Um, Margaret Ross's book is called A Timeshare, and the first thing I think about that title is, wow, what a lonely and depressing figure for the collective. Um, you know, it, it, it turns time into the mercantile, into property, and it's one in which you're continuous with others without ever seeing them, only in contractual relation, but occupying that space and time serially and alone. Um, luckily, there, the, the title can mean many other things in the context of a book of poetry and as the title of a book of poetry. I would say to the lonely and um, isolating and over decisive measures of calendrical time and clock time, Margaret proposes the um, formal dramas and the dramatic time of verse itself. It's a poetry that's highly enjammed, which means that it's always both ending and going on. Um, and it wants, I think, to invite a reader into the intimacy of reanimating the formal time of composition again and again and again, of a line stopping while a sentence goes on, of a quatrain stopping while a sentence goes on, quatrain after quatrain after quatrain, open rather than the closed sealed boxes of the calendar. Um, the, the, poem that begins the book starts with the single word, a sentence countdown, already announcing, I, I think, not that we're ever gonna get to zero, but that we are underway, that we are in time, rather than sealed in a, a facsimile of time. The last word in the collection is go, right up against a period. So it's constantly a poetry that's fighting against bad finitude, in part by making the good temporary finitudes of line, sentence, quatrain, etc. In the second poem in the collection, um, it talks about being on the road to paradise. I think that's another great figure in the book for what it's like to read the book. Um, we are always on the road rather than at paradise. We are doomed to be pre-paradise, and that might be the time that we share. In that final poem that ends go, we find 23 quatrains, and there's not a single moment of line terminal punctuation in any of the 92 lines. But as you're going through it, um, you realize, well, there's this problem, there's this countdown, there's this formal doom, because what's gonna happen at the end of the last line? And of course, there is a period there. It can't go on forever, but it can end on go. Um, all those moments of fighting against boundary and end and passing through them I think also a figure, another kind of sharing in the book, which I would call polyvocality. Um, the poems are always measuring how long a self can speak for um, uninterruptedly. And one of the ways in which it measures that duration is by interrupting that self with other versions of the self or distinct other voices. It kind of reminds me when it happens in the book of that moment in Milton's Lycidas when St. Peter suddenly interrupts the bard with his own italics. Um, so, the poem is, is a time that we can share. It's both permanent and, and final and full of finitude, and yet it's also reanimatable and transitory. I think that intimacy of reactivating composition is an antidote to the loneliness that the book also fully describes. Welcome, Margaret Ross. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, and thank you, Noah and Mose, and um, to all of you for being here. I'm really honored to read in this series. Um, I'm going to read six poems, and I thought I'd start with the book and then move into new work. A Timeshare. Five o'clock again in the rented living room. Nothing wrong. Heliotrope continuing to fade into upholstery. Buttons pressing back against the back of the couch make the surface cave, just decorative, faint garden stamped on a cotton throw. And that the world, yes, no, 
Yes, though, if there is such a thing as time at all, I never saw it move. And if that's so, then what am I afraid of? I hung a muslin curtain to prove breeze, a nimble petal, tall fluctuating seraphim who keeps watch over me. Q, what are you doing down there in the meantime? X, all day I am an orchard at midday when the stunned air pauses, bronze and stupid, terse with flies. Don't lie, I'm in the living room. Seconds dropping from the faucet to the metal bed of the sink. This is your one, now this is, now late. Nobody waits for thee on the greeny moor where I was laying all stuck with you. Or the cue, do you recall the dream of a point repaired to when alone? Some to the landfill, some to the promontory, each with a small smooth stone tapping soft on his chest or clicking against his teeth when on his tongue. Once you thought you would learn what to do with yourself by yourself. Once the stakes flush high as a view from the beautiful private plane, all persons disappear and he alone looks down on freeways embroidering the vacant earth. It was still early in my life. X, go along, touch your eye. Do you know how to do that thing of whispering a fact repeatedly until it stops being true? Return to this apartment after being gone a while to find everything replaced with replicas, identically arranged. The cedar desk had the same false front as before and fitted with the same brass garland handle, still unable to pull out a drawer because it is no drawer. That was the soul. Home furnished with secondhand pieces. White hooded lamps are nursed to me all night when I can snap space open like a parachute, make the walls up. When I lived out a summer with a blind man by the sea, he kept a steady squint. I closed my eyes. It was still early then in my brief life, evenings, every morning at the folding table, painting his toast black with marmite. Once she was me, we took turns for the bed. A room with everything white except the book spines makes you feel the good kind of dead. When is it? Someone's child downstairs leans on the bell again. Lived winters half an hour away or seven minutes on the red line. Times he had me scissor bracken stalks to stanch the mud floor of the animal shed. From space, the night's a hammock swinging gently out across our earth. Each fall slushed over, bird calls, tiny screws creaking shut your mind. When I used my fingernail to scrape white tallies on my naked ankle, then. Think of the long trip home. You're already home. All the loyal, idiot details know what to do to stay believable. But you, you who sit and let the light rust, reddening all around you, waiting for anyone to come and tell you to get up, get up. Nobody is. Um, this next poem comes out of an experience I've had, which maybe some of you have had as well, um, which is that a lot of beauty products, especially those designed to be anti-aging, have these really sinister names, such that like, if you didn't know that it was a moisturizer, you could think it was like the title of some really grim book of philosophy. <laughs> um, I have a little serum called When Hope Is Not Enough. <laughs> um, there's also the total truth. Um, this poem is called Age Control Concentrate. It looks like water, feels like water with the ease of water leached. Ever blow a raw egg through its pinpricked shell? A sterner and more cautious thing. Feels like water with enhanced wariness to be twice daily rubbed into the face. It's possible to think, said my grandmother's grandfather, without apparent wrinkling. 
The skin, a stupid flag, flies any country consciousness has seized. Star at the edge, X center, sickle where a question was, and now a girl with laser gun aimed at the price stickers. No returns window. Pressed my temple to the streaky pane of the subway glass to watch a fingerprinted black rip by, fast fabric ending at the billboard of a woman's forehead, blinking back and forth from lined to clear. Hunch the self is many personed sequence. Every day I woke inside another person's shape and dressed it in the same red sweater. There's nothing like the sight of repetition purged of sense. I don't know what thought traveled me so many times. Its route shows plainly on my face. I've kept from girlhood strict divisions in the head. So what I felt was as it were arrested where it could not crease appearance. Is there no method to flush out the self that wants the others gone? Misgivings drowned. All attention held there in the room where the time is wide and a long enduring doubt lifts your hand to its paper cheek as an old man singing scraps from the twenties he is certain he is still a child in. And if my features never move again, then? The first half of a makeover is free. The beautician hones a boundary, cutting off the red side of the mouth from the dull, the sepia shaded right from the left eye. Explains it's best to smooth the fragile lid using the digit with least power. There we are, to be applied at night. There's $90 water you can buy to look like you have never lived this life. Beige ceiling mirrored in the chrome top counter, modeling the thought of a fleeting, brittle, standard issue, cheap, tight, one second now, one second next, provisional arrangement, where just repeating myself blows a substance so changeable, I only touch it with ring finger. Less muscle, so less pull. Yes, even if they're still. You can lie yourself in bed and wake up in the upscale public restroom of your life. From stalls step many replicas of some guy in complete tuxedo. The marble was pink. They began to hit them, him on him, all of them, or did, but so no blood appeared, stall doors slamming back and forth and echoing off the marble. Macho. A man in long shorts had a tiny dog he tossed into the leaves piled at the edge of people's yards. The dog the same brown as the leaves. Too small to bark, it squeaked as it was tossed. I was seeing someone and we passed it on our way downtown. A street where boys stuck dollar bills over coils of shit, then watched to see who stopped to pick them up, then jeered from the window. They were in college, living together. Girls lived together too, and it was warm enough you could still see them tanning on a roof or in the kiddie pools they dragged to strips of grass along the sidewalk. The dog's name was Macho. I hoped out loud whenever we were walking, we would see it. He found this hope annoying, then pathetic. He said, I think you wish you were that dog. No, I want it. I don't want to be it. I think you want to be it. We were in love or in some other thing love served as cover for. It required constant testing, trying to humiliate while seeming innocent, uninvested. Back then, I didn't understand that everybody did these things, choking or pissing on each other, having the girl impersonate a child being molested. You got somewhere, and after, you were where you started. We drove across the river to the discount grocer where the baggers wore black aprons over buttoned shirts and pushed your cart out to your car for you, 
Even if you asked them not to, it was mandatory. Next door, the gas station sold souvenirs of itself, lighters, and what looked like earring boxes packed with thumb-sized gummy pizzas. Sun touched the river. Complicated trees leaned out at angles to the water. On the radio, a man who made a movie was explaining no one got it. It isn't funny. The frozen chicken triggers something for the boy, his realization. Around us stretched the aisles of the fields, then prairie, prairie grasses over whose incessant restlessness the roads and towns were pieced. And far out, moving slow across the earth, black carriages of Mennonites drawn by horses. My job was teaching acting at a middle school. The skinniest of the Sams was most talented. Asked to be an animal, the other children jumped or squawked, but Sam's face hardened to a twitching glare, his paws examining the rug before they crossed it. On the porch, coffee cans preserved summer rain, cigarette butts gone tender, floating. You could smoke and look out at the uncut lawn, down to the snapped stakes of tomato plants he'd smashed when he was angry. It had started with us laughing, lying in the grass, him saying, let me cut off a piece of your scarf to remember today by. No, it started from my only feeling I was myself when I resisted things. I turned away. I felt his scissors in my hair. Late fall, the town put on its festival, three generations wandering in jerseys carrying foam fingers. He was house-sitting, and along the wall, some books I knew wore bindings I'd never seen. They belonged together. They were all dark red with notches down their spines. If you debased yourself before a man debased you, then you'd have a little peace. It was a choice then. It was running ahead of the others and standing on the bank where you could see yourself how things went the ragged progress of the lichen, gnats, a swimming beach, the concrete becoming gravel. I thought that way for years. <coughs> Songs of Innocence and Experience. A classroom in a basement, and the students, people, I am at most five years older than, each sitting with the same few pages marked in different shades of highlighter and bullets, stars in the margin. I'm being paid to teach something called writing as an ethical act. I wear dark colors to appear more credible. Everybody in the basement knows the ethical act is writing I assign to read. Student writing is constructing arguments from excerpts of a story or a poem we call supporting evidence, proof. You read something, then make a case about it. That's how you get graded. On Thursdays, volunteering at a home for girls, girls aren't allowed to leave distributing pens and paper, asking, anybody want to share? One girl says, this is one I wrote last night, and reads The Tiger. One reads a poem remembering her sister. Poems in the shape of hearts, of suns, each ray a line extending to the edges of the page. One girl writing daily before sleeping. Don't teach anything you love too much, was advice I was given. Every act supporting evidence, the history of describing history, everybody in the basement. The class read songs of innocence and experience in the Mecca, the Book of the Dead. Driving back, I pulled off, walked out into dry leaves, leaves up to my calves. You felt rich wading through them. I lay down underneath the folding branches, mapping the intricate angles of attempt, of wind, of competition, hunger, need, of hunger, hunger, compromise. 
when I said what I did to a doctor studying my naked body for any threatening mark map by the sun. He told me he took poetry in college. His office was a white box on an asphalt circle poured over the prairie. Magazines in the waiting room, not touched enough to be soft yet. You could see the flat land stretching from the window, green and still, divided by the one road going straight for miles. I'd just turned 25. I got hired to stay for the summer term. Summer students were younger, still illiterate. They could dictate captions for their drawings. The jagged dinosaurs and flowers, damp sky colored in entirely with blue marker. Coloring and coloring, one spot on the paper made the paper tear. It rained so violently that summer, streets rushed with temporary rivers. While it rained, the students ate lunch in the library, inventing games with food or paper clips or drumming fists against each other's backs in time to a sing-song list of commands that started, concentrate, concentrate, people are dying. History. We were looking for a present in a farmhouse where they sold old things. The place had been arranged so several versions of a room could live together. Three tables in the kitchen circled by four sets of chairs and stacks of mismatched dishes clicking with each step we took. The present would be for his parents a wooden radio with gold mesh stretched across the speaker. The place where he was living later burned, but this was while we'd lie around the bedroom eating rotisserie chicken with our fingers. His body was so beautiful, I wanted to hurt it, but I couldn't do it right from outside. I had to go in through the mind. It wasn't how you cheated, it was how you lied until the truth felt suspect, misleading. The radio was broken and I watched his fingers picking for a long time at the wires, quiet. I watched the soft transition from the tan skin at his nape to the lighter skin of the throat, his bare shoulders. When a voice came on saying a man was shooting in a school, my first thought was that must be some past lodged in the radio, old, old as it was. We looked at each other. The voice cut out. The school was where the man's mother taught. People talked about it for a week on stations I heard riding to and from a dog I walked. I thought I was a loving person because I reassured the owner I would use the shock collar when her dog got loud, then didn't use it. Beige clouds in a greenish sky seen through cheap sunglasses. I'd lean down, sucking him off as he drove, and speed fed ragged currents through my body. When I sat back up, I lost those. The motion then, just something you looked at. Wide, bright afternoon in loose expanses, passing, passing. Between two fields, a dentist's office. One neon pink tooth shone above the door. When we got to town, a line of restaurants propping up a long glass second story wall behind which sweating, almost naked people cycled and a low rise where I woke once to the noise of a girl methodically breaking dishes as a message to the roommate of the friend whose bed I lay in. But the roommate was gone. Touching certain strangers, I could feel the future just beneath the surface of their skin. Things can happen. You could sense time quicken beneath your hand. The future or the past? I want to know. Do I hurt people because of what they made me feel 
Or do I have feelings I have always had and try to make the world look like it gave them to me? This is the last poem I'll read. Um, it's in sections and they're not numbered um, and I won't really acknowledge them, but I'll pause a little bit where there's an asterisk. Love. I always try to memorize his face, but I never can. I can say he has a face, he has a body, an apartment. He has a bowl of ice water where he soaks his hands because of tendons in his fingers. He has a plant with long leaves on the ledge above his toilet. Once when I was there and he had left the room, I wrote on a scrap of paper in my wallet, he's just a person, so I could read it later when I was home. I wait where the dirt path through a meadow lets out at a gravel patch beside the paved road. The air smells heavy, opulent. Before the place the forest starts are orchards. The story is my car broke down and he's a stranger driving by. Or I park on his street and stand a minute gathering myself behind the car. When I step out front, I'll see him, blue lit, sitting at the window typing. He won't hear me move until I tap my knuckles to the glass. It's hard to look at him right away, so I look at the white stretch of his t-shirt, the nubby lattice pattern of the rug. I step off my heels. He wants me to kneel in front of a mirror and say my name and point to every part of me that's his. At a party, a stranger wearing nothing but a fishing net embraces me because he loves my friend who wears a matching net with shiny lures taped to her nipples. A person in a pilgrim costume says the person in the corner saved her marriage by becoming what she calls their third. She met the person at the park. Their daughters have the same name. When I ask him not to say my name, he thinks I'm saying names would feel too close. They feel too distant. He hands me the folded remnant of a shirt he tore off me the week before. I think you leave things here on purpose. I didn't leave that, it's garbage. You also left your hair thing. Later, we watch a video of him climb a cliff next to the ocean. The day is cloudy, shadowless. We watch his fingers feel out angles of the rock and pull his body higher. 3,000 people watched it before me. From his bed, you see the dense crown of a fig tree in the yard next door where the tenant hung himself last spring. Now blue tarp curtains the house. The landlord is renovating. I feel a happiness so concentrated, it feels like fear. He has a lamp, he softens when I come, draping his shirt over the shade. He has a winding blue-green helix tattooed up his side. On my way, I stop at gas stations and stand in the bathroom checking. If you say the feeling out loud, it sounds comic, disproportionate. I press brown paper towel to my forehead. Sun covered the bed. I lay listening to him moving through the other room, hearing water, hearing something open, shut, then nothing, then him coming nearer. How do you get close to a person? Once you got past pleasure, there was pain. No, there was pleasure turning into something pain was part of. If you can let them hurt you deep enough, you'll be inside the other person. Driving up nights on the freeway, 
dark fields tearing by on either side, I practice saying hi. Hi. Thank you.